32. Wait, I'm off sides. <laughs> oh my god. Hey, it's Zach from MNF, and today Jeff Halavy, entrepreneur and former health wellness and fitness correspondent on the Today Show, discusses his new AI trainer. It's a really cool sounding product, but what I liked even more about our discussion was some of the troubles and mistakes he made in the past and how he overcame them. Today's show is generously sponsored by GNC. From the number one selling lit pre-workout to the game-changing Burn MF, Beyond Raw formulas are made to make a real difference. And with the explosive flavors like Jolly Rancher Watermelon and Green Apple, Gummy Worm and Iced Tea Lemonade, you'll keep coming back for more. So get to GNC or GNC.com and go beyond the fire with Beyond Raw. I'm not uh, at lunch, I'm at like recess because I'm, I'm back at school. Uh, I am currently in Boston. Uh, okay. there's Cambridge right behind me. Uh, I was accepted to a program at Harvard business school that, uh, is kind of like, um, it's like an MBA 2.0. So the only way you can get in is if, uh, you know, you're running a successful company, you know, you've got some, you've, you've built the resume a little bit right. and, uh, and so I still am not sure why they let me in, but I, I actually said to somebody that I think they made a mistake, but, uh, yeah, but you, I applied. You, you can't mean that dude. Like you have, you, you know, you're, you've got chops. Um, you know, you, you were the correspondent for the today show. Am I wrong here for the, yeah, I, was, I was a health correspondent. That's correct. Okay. I mean, that's, well, that's not, not business. <laughs> right, <laughs> but that, That's not really a business accolade. You know, I fell ass backwards into a TV career. I don't know if I told you this, this is a true story. I um, never had aspirations of um, being on TV. Like that just was like, not at all uh, in my, um, like on my radar. And uh, in like 2009, I think it was, I, I, someone reaches out to me out of nowhere I don't know how they have my number or anything, but they reach out to me and they leave me a message saying that they're calling from the biggest loser. And uh, they're curious if I would be open to auditioning for the show. And I'm like, this is definitely a scam. Like, first of all, how does the biggest loser know about me? Cause you know, I no name or anything like that. And, um, and then also, like, why would they ask me to like, like the whole thing just seemed weird. And I call back. For what though? Or, what did they want you to audition for? Like, did you want well, like, I'll, I'll like, tell you. So okay. I call back. It turns out it's completely legitimate. Jillian Michaels was planning on leaving the show for a few years to raise kids. So I ended up two years in a row in the final five that they actually pitched to NBC. Cause I guess NBC, it like kind of has like an ultimate say as the buyer or whatever. And me, right. Yeah. And so Brett Hobel um, beat me the first year and Dolvet Quince beat me the year after that. But because of the, the, you know, the opportunity that I had all of a sudden I like got on like the, you know, TV people's uh, radar, like they just saw me doing segments like in New York and, you know, just to promote myself and my business, you know? Okay, but uh, how do you get to do segments? Are you talking about segments on NBC or like local news? No, no, this is like local, local media. Um, I just, how did I get those first segments, man? I don't even remember. Uh, probably paid somebody off. <laughs> but <clears throat> I, um, yeah, I, I, I couldn't honestly even tell you how I got the first segments, but what, what I can tell you what I did do though, is that I always tried to over deliver, be super easy to work with, um, you know, bend over backwards. And because of that, I had journalists that would come back to me because, you know, I just, I made life easy and I, I, I spoke in sound bites for them. And I did all of like the, you know, the things that, that I could do in order to make their lives easier. So that ended up um, you, you know, creating more opportunities either with, with them or with other, uh, you know, stations or, or even, you know, across different media. So like I do an interview and then someone would be like, oh, you should talk to my friend at X magazine, you know, like they're looking for an expert. For so that, that's how it all started. And, um, and then, you know, so that, that stuff led to TV and then, you know, just by, by sort of 
um, having the opportunity to audition, even though I was rejected, that just led to other opportunities. And, and I, it ultimately led to my own TV show. I actually got my own TV show before the Today Show. Um, it, was, it was pretty brutal. It was like a brand new network at the time. Uh, it was called Veria, V-E-R-I-A. Okay. Um, and it, it since re- rebranded as Z Living, like the letter Z Living. It, it, the show is actually an international syndication. It's not on in the U.S. anymore. Thank God. Um, <laughs> it re- we, we sh- I was like, you can if you watch that show, which I would not recommend anybody actually do, but if you watch the show, like I can, you can tell where I am in the season, like how I sequentially shot that show because I look more and more fatigued as time goes on because we were shooting the entire day. I was still doing my best to run a couple of businesses before and afterwards. And uh, we were crashing into production. So after we finished shooting for the day, we were already just, you know, planning the, the, you know, what we're literally doing the next morning. So it was, it's pretty crazy. So uh, as you're getting into this, what is it that you're doing? Um, so like, you know, you said you were promoting yourself and you were trying to kind of get yourself out there, but you, you kind of walked backwards into this TV uh, situation. But what what were, what was it that you were doing? I'm, I'm still not sure about that. Yeah, I'm still not sure either. I wasn't sure what I was doing then and I'm still not 100% sure what I'm doing now, but some of it's paying off. So that's what keeps me, that, that's keeps me going. going to school. I mean, you're going to, yeah. a, what you go, what, which school is it? To a, to a prestigious East Coast University. Yeah, I, was gonna say, I feel like I've heard of that school before. Um, well, part of it's in Boston, the other part's in Cambridge, and you know I'm still not not quite sure uh, how I'm here. It's a trip though to like live in a dorm room again. I can palm the ceiling, <laughs> which is oh, is kind of kind of cool. Yeah, I have like a cubby for my backpack. You get demerits and you get detentions now. Um. <laughs> There's apple juice and cookies after nap time, which is pretty nice. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, I will look, I, my, I've had, I've had a very uh, colorful and nonlinear career. Uh, so my first, my first real career was as a musician. And uh, what instrument and, do you play? I started on bass, but but uh, taught myself keys, uh, guitar, drums. Um, and then ended up writing like a whole bunch of electronic stuff too, um, and and just like played with every kind of band you can imagine. So I, I did everything imaginable, and then I kind of got uh, ejected from that career uh, because before I was a rock star, I was living the rock and you know the rock star lifestyle. And, um, you know, it just, it, it went down uh, a pretty dark path that, that coincided with a lot of, um, you know, past trauma that I had from a few things, you know, during my youth, uh, right. one of which was. So was don't, don't, don't skip over this stuff. This is, this is interesting to me. I'm, I'm curious about these times. And I think, I, I mean, look, I, I'd like to think other people would be too, because I feel like a lot of people go through these and successful people a lot of times like to skirt over this stuff or they like to you know not a, not kind of get into the the nitty gritty and to me i think it's important because it's you know how you got out of it may help somebody else um or, or your experience may help somebody else you know uh, and even me like i'm going i go through stuff all the time where i'm like looking for you know people that have done something differently or, or better or something that I could learn from that I could take, take with that and, and evolve, you know? So if you don't mind, I'm just curious, like. I'm an open book. I, I have nothing to hide. Uh, and I've actually found, uh, you know, the, the process of sharing to be, um, you know, to be helpful for others. And especially just like as a dude, and this is a problem, uh, generally speaking, as, as guys, we don't, we don't want to seem weak. Right. Uh, we don't like to share, uh, especially, you know, those of us who, who have, um, you know, certain career tracks, we're even less likely to, you know, to say anything because we want to just have a, an appearance of, you know, of what we are, but um, I, I'm happy to talk about it. I mean, the, the big one for me, um, I, I didn't have an easy childhood. Um, 
and just lots of stuff uh, that, that happened in my childhood. Um, you know, abuse, uh, you know, I was, um, you know, uh, I, I was the poorest kid in the school that I went to. Um, and, you know, it, it kind of like all culminated at the end of elementary school when I found out that the headaches and pressure that I had in my head were the were being caused by a uh, tumor the size of a pear uh, that was sitting right behind my eyes, right below my brain and right above my hard palate. Uh, it's called an angiofibroma, which is a vascular tumor. So that creates its own complications because aside from being in the middle of my head, uh, it couldn't just be excised immediately because I would bleed out. I'd literally bleed to death on the operating table, which almost happened if we had gone for the first surgeon uh, that was gonna do my surgery. So what they actually need to do is shoot little tiny darts in the tumor first, uh, it's called em embolization. And uh, that needed to be done before. The reason they wanted to get it out so quickly though is because it was like literally less than a paper's width away from my optic nerve. And once the optic nerve is compromised, uh, you're blind for life, like period. They can't, they can't, at least to date, they cannot reverse it. Not that I know of at least. And um, so, uh, you know, so I went through what was, definitely very traumatic experience because I didn't know if I was going to wake up or not. You know, once I had an 11 hour surgery and that was one of two, like I had the embolization first. And then, you know, I think it was like three or four days later, I had this crazy 11 hour surgery. And the crazy part is my whole life, I told myself a story. And the story was, I wasn't afraid. I was too young and too stupid. And I just, you know, listen to what the adults had to say, which is that, you know, I'd be okay. And um, I only found out within the last few years uh, as part of this, um, you know, I don't know what I'd call it, but, you know, as part of my spiritual growth, um, I, 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 I asked my, this came up, like I can get into all kinds of other stuff, but it came up and I asked my mom, I said something about not being afraid. And she just looks at me and she's like, what are you talking about? And I was like, what? I was, you know, too young, too stupid, listen to the adults. And she's like, the night before the, the main surgery, you asked me if you're going to live or die. I mean, and imagine, you know, like my mom, I can't even begin as a father, especially now, I can't imagine it, you know, but my mom having her, you know, 14 year old son ask her if he is going to live or die, you know, and of course she reassured me and everything, but you know, she said, you, you may not remember that, but I will always remember it because I stayed up crying the rest of the night, you know, and I, I eventually fell asleep. So, uh, but, but, you know, what, what that did is uh, unbeknownst to me or anybody else around me, because, you know, I was not a, a you know, veteran and the understanding of trauma was very different, uh, you know, 25 years, over 25 years ago than it is, uh, you know, now. And, you uh, and, and I, I had PTSD uh, manifest in my system. And uh, the reason I say manifest is that PTSD isn't necessarily something where there's just like stimulus response. Um, so there, you know, I think that a lot of times people believe that there's going to be like a rapid change. And that's how you know if someone uh, has incurred, you know, this, this traumatic wound to the psyche. But what happened for me is I, you know, I, 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 I healed, you know, it took months after my surgery because they went in through my hard palate and I you know, couldn't eat, talk, you know, swallow even in the beginning. I couldn't do anything. Um, my, my head looked like I, it was like uh, someone used me as a, a pinata, you know, like I was in a car accident. It was terrible, all swollen. And, um, and what happened was a few months after the surgery, I'm a freshman in high school. And I start getting these crying bouts out of nowhere. And I know that like, I'm sad. Uh, I know that I have like this feeling, but I would go run and hide and cry. And, um, and, and I didn't, you know, I don't want to go for help for sure. And by the way, you know, having crying bouts, unexpected crying bouts when you're a freshman in high school sucks. That's no, a very... That. Oh, I thought that's how you got laid a lot. Um, no, no, no. <laughs> this is like the pre-emo and, you know, whatever days. Like, it wasn't cool to, uh, you know. And, and so I'd go um, I'd go run and hide. And, and I eventually got 
you know, this is so embarrassing. My mom caught me in her basement, like sobbing. And she asked me if everything was okay. And I'm like, I'm fine. Go away. You know, like, yeah, this is a happy um, cry. Exactly. Yeah. And so I, you know, I tried to just like brush it off. And, and the thing is I did, I was able to like get out of that situation without like that immediate situation without my mom thinking something was majorly wrong. You know, like I just was like, get away, leave me alone. You know, I'm fine. And, um, and then over like the next few years, my behavior started to change. Um, you know, to say that I became like moody would be an understatement, but also I was like a teenager. So that kind of gets hidden. Uh, but I was fatalistic. Uh, you know, at that point in time, I was not actively suicidal, but I did a lot of things that could have easily led to my uh, death. And I remember what I thought, you know, which was that. Uh, what were some of those things? I'm just curious. Oh, uh, uh, a lot of them were in the context of like bravado and stupid bets and stuff like that, like doing backflips off my house, uh, consuming massive amounts of alcohol. Um, and doing stupid things. Sometimes, it, it, you know, stupid thing was the massive amount of alcohol in, it, in and of itself, but um, just a lot of, um, you know, uh, substance induced uh, stupidity or like, I don't think it was, see, like, I'm of the were, mindset. That, were there other substances? I'm curious, like, were you yeah. into drugs or like, oh, uh, oh, you're open book. So, I mean, let, let's, yeah, let's, let's yeah. get to it. I'm curious. Well, I, I don't, but I, what I don't like the same to, position. What, yeah, what I don't like to do though is I don't like to glorify anything. So it's like I rather because you're saying how you're but you're saying how it was traumatic for you and you're saying what you went through to you know like what you turned to. And I don't know if it's look, you you can say it's glorifying it, I understand it's it's your story, but to me it's not. Like I know people in my life that did the same thing and they didn't make it out. So yeah, it's yeah. it's not glorifying it. I'm saying like it's it's just kind of what what they did. Um, you know, for, for, for me coming, growing up in a small town, it was a lot of, um, prescription drugs. It was a lot of like, um, you know, opiates, it was a lot of Oxycontin and, and Vicodins and, um, Xanax and all those types of things. And some of my friends just didn't, didn't make it. Um, yeah. some went to jail and some just got totally effed up and they, they, they fucked their life up and that's that, yep. but like, they didn't bounce back and make it out. And I mean, if they could, again, they would tell the story now and some of them do, they would say, terrible idea, uh, bad idea at the time. Uh, I thought it was fine or I thought I had it under control or I thought it was just what kids did and, and it's not. Um, and they just were really good at either hiding it or they had parents who were oblivious. So like, I'm not saying it to, to say like, oh my God, you're, you're so cool. You were in a band and you were doing a ton of drugs or you were doing whatever. I'm saying again, for people that may, um, may be in this spot and they, and I hope, God, if, we, if, if there's one person that hears it and says, shit, man, that's me. I don't like this. Like, look at this dude. This dude is now, you know, going to school a, 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 again. And he was uh, on the Today Show and he's, he's got these businesses. Like, that's, that's the thing, man. Like, there's nothing, they can do it. They can do it too, but you have to make that, decision to want to. Um, and I want to get to that point to where you made that turn, that epiphany, but I guess, I guess I'm just trying to get to the details. No, yeah. Well, well yeah. what I'd say is this is I just, I don't like, like the, you know, the sort of like the war stories version where it's like, I once did so much of this drug and you know, like, I, I just don't like to get into that. I, what I'd say is this is I had zero discretion and, uh, everything was on the table, you know? Um, or so you were, you were sucking a lot of helium and, uh, <laughs> and lewds and uh, no, I don't know, like, what, what people... I, I wish it was helium, uh, <laughs> to, to the best of my knowledge, helium, helium won't do anything other than, uh, you know, give you, give you a ridiculous voice for a couple minutes, but, um, but yeah, it was, it wasn't helium. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I just, so, so anyway, um, so, so, and then, you know, so what I'd say is that, I, you know, I, I was considered like a very challenging, you know, teen and I, I definitely was. I ended up uh, getting thrown out of high school after my junior year. And um, and then I went to community college. Like, I think it's funny because like right now, I mean, it's pretty obvious the school that I'm at, which is uh, Harvard, um, you know, from the way we described it before. But, you know, I'm a Harvard business school in a program that that's 
very tough to get into because it's uh, it, it's the, the, the this is only for you know people who who have built companies uh, to a certain extent. So they're they're very selective with their admissions process. And uh, I have a GED, so um, you know I'm actually really proud. I, as a matter of fact, so after I get thrown out of uh, out of uh, high school, I end up going to a community college. It turned my life around. I went to Rockland Community College in Rockland County, New York. And on my first day of class here, I actually wore a Rockland Community College t-shirt. And it just felt, um, I don't know, it just felt really, it just felt good. Cause I was like, this is where I came from. Like I, yeah. I you know, I definitely did not expect you know, to be sitting, uh, you know, at Harvard, um, you know, one day and, and, and here I am. Um, so, so I ended up going to Rockland Community College and I kind of, you know, I had like a respite for a couple of years where I turned things around and, you know, I, I was an exemplary student and uh, I ended up from there uh, transferring after two years as a junior to NYU, which gave me a merit scholarship. And so I completely turned around the academic piece. And then, you know, I don't know what happened, but like, I just completely uh, fell off the deep end. Um, you know, once I went and, you know, moved to the city, my, my mental state like deteriorated really rapidly, a lot of substance abuse. Um, I ended up losing that merit scholarship. Uh, were like, were you in depression or was it? It, it was, I, there weren't too many things you know, I was basically like a walking DSM five or six. I don't even know what we're up to now, but you know, the point is I was a walking DS. I just had like, I don't even know what of, that is. I was just nodding to like, pretend Oh, so that's look stupid. But I'm that like, is the, uh, it's the, it's like the diagnostic manual for uh, psychiatric illnesses. Okay. So they, you know, it started with like the DSM one. And I think they're up to probably, um, you know, the DSM five or six or something like that. And I don't know, maybe more, uh, but um you know, I, I had a lot of problems. I mean, everything from, uh, I, I was convinced, I have an uncle who died of Lou Gehrig's and I thought that I might have it because I, all of a sudden I had like zero energy. My, my limbs were numb, my hands were like ice. And it turned out that I was clinically depressed, like a, an awful depression. I, I spent about three weeks on a recliner at my parents' house at one point in time. Um, barely moved, uh, you know, I, I still don't know how I got out of it, you know, but eventually like, you know, turned a little bit of a corner on the whole thing and I guess got, got a little better, but, uh, I dealt with massive, uh, anxiety. Um, my, my nervous system was basically like jacked to like 11 out of 10, um, you know, uh, on, on, I'd say like, a. Well, I guess it wouldn't be a parasympathetic sympathetic scale, but like just the sympathetic scale, forget about parasympathetic was off the table, but I was right. always at like an 11 out of 10. And, you know, this is, this is like classic PTSD. And I had a lot of, uh, you know, issues with my nervous system, you know, sort of being jacked like that, you know, and, and the medications I was on were not really helping. Like I was everything that like could have gone wrong in a lot of ways other than me dying went wrong like being seeing the wrong doctors being prescribed the wrong medications that actually made things worse um I, you know it, it was a really really tough time and it it culminated in um you know I, I was in rehab uh five times like inpatient programs uh by the time it was uh fall or summer um 20, I'm sorry, 2001. And, uh, and then I had some legal stuff that happened and, uh, I was facing, uh, some pretty serious charges and, and like time. Okay. So what, what were you then incarcerated for? What were you? I was not incarcerated. I was lucky enough, lucky enough to, uh, receive something called pretrial intervention. Uh, and, um, which, which resulted in, in actually being on probation uh, for a couple of years. Um, well, what was it that you were, what was it that you were accused of? It, it was, I was, uh, in a, um, you know, a, a, a substance induced state that ultimately led to me challenging a SWAT team. 
And uh, right, are we talking about meth here? Okay, come on, come on, I gotta know. Like, I mean, I'm yeah. not even saying. Like, I really do have to know because I'm curious. Like, when you say that, you're you're taking on a SWAT team. You have to be out of your mind, man. Like, yeah, I was. Well, I was definitely out of my mind, and it was an, it was another drug that that will make people feel like they can, you know, take on a, a, a lot more than they can, and also give them a lot of paranoid thoughts and you know all that stuff. And uh, and it was mixed with other substances so um were you at all concerned about like maybe my heart will stop or maybe like my brain will explode or my heart will explode did you even think about that or did you not care uh i really didn't care i mean i i already at that point in time um uh, had stopped breathing twice by mixing uh alcohol and benzodiazepines um you know which are, which are medications like uh xanax and you know stuff like that so um, that's incredibly dangerous. And I'd say, you know, if there's anybody, uh, who's, who's watching, listening, uh, who knows someone who, who does that, you know, you, you can't intervene soon enough. Um, yeah. it's just a very, very dangerous combination. And, yeah, I, uh, I mean, look, man, I used to do that a lot with my buddies when I was younger, um, because I didn't know any better other than the feeling that it gave you when you started to realize how dangerous it was, you know, a few of, few of us that it didn't have a grip on would be like we're idiots yeah <laughs> like what are we doing um yeah, how's that yeah I, what i'd say is that uh, like I, I i i didn't quite know how bad it could be uh but i also didn't care you know i i remember there were times where i was like annihilated and i was just like if today is my last day whatever Man, you know i just that's... Yeah, I just was not, yeah, I was not, um, I was not uh, into life. Um, I was in a lot of fucking pain. And, and part of the problem is I couldn't even, I couldn't even identify what like the thing is. Cause I, I used to think to myself, like, why am I so fucked up? Yeah. And, you know, I knew what my history was. Like I knew what had happened in my life. Um, but I also knew the set of circumstances that I had then, which is, okay, I survived and I should be thankful and, uh, you know, I'm not starving, you know, and, and I couldn't, but I just couldn't break myself out of, um, you, you know, out of this. And, and that's why I really do believe, you know, most of the, the current literature suggests very strongly that trauma, uh, is, you know, is stored in the body. Uh, there's actually an excellent book uh, by Bessel van der Kolk uh, called The Body Keeps the Score, mm -hmm. uh, which is about, you know, how trauma manifests in the body. And I, I think a lot of this is, it, it's, I don't know if this is a word, but it's, it's like supra mental. It's, it's, it's not, uh, you can't outthink depression or outreason it. Uh, or, or a lot of these, you know, conditions. It, you, it's not a, it's not a logical problem. It's an emotional problem, and um, you, you know, I think especially as guys, we try to show up to solve emotional problems with logic. I mean, just ask my wife. <laughs> so, um, or ask any woman. I mean, that's like a large part of the disconnect. Is like we're always showing up with these logical solutions and. Uh, or what we think are logical solutions. But the, the, the thing is, it's very, very difficult to actually do that. And when we're trying to heal trauma, when we're trying to, to, you know, to change the course of our lives um, and, and heal wounds of, from the past, the, the, I don't think that the logical piece uh, always really works. Um, maybe eventually by talking it out, somewhere, get, someone gets somewhere where they feel better about it and they do heal and they're able to move on, but no one ever sits there who's been through trauma and goes, oh yeah, I survived. So I should be thankful. And that's that. Yeah. That never happens. That never, ever, ever happens. It takes us time to metabolize it. And it's almost like it needs to work its way through the nervous system. And I, that's why I, I personally think that, you know, uh, psychedelics uh, are, are really the, um, you know, the drug of the future, um, or I should say the medicine of the future for uh for psychotherapy because what they what they do is they allow uh this uh metabolization to happen and happen rapidly 
you know, uh, you know, just, just even any of the studies that are, and they're, they're now just, you know, more and more every single day looking at MDMA or right. psilocybin. Psilocybin, yep. That's, that's what I believe they do is they just allow the metabolization to occur because there are a lot of reasons that it, 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 it can't occur. It didn't occur. And they remove a lot of the boundaries uh, and allow us to, um, you know, to, to, to work these things through. You know, I'd love I don't to, even remember where we were. We were no, just like, I'd all love over. to dive into that with you again sometime. <laughs> I swear, like, because that's something that I've, I've been researching recently. And that's something that I do want to do um, something on. And I, I'd love to speak with people about because I do think it's, it's interesting, right? Like, why not take something like that when it's under a doctor's care than say something that's going to be consistently, I don't know, that, you're, that your body's going to adapt to, that you're going to need more and you're going to have to pump more of it into your system. Like, if that can help you, and it seems like every study I've seen, be it soldiers with PTSD or people that are really just like down and out, it can really help them rebound. I mean, it, it it's it's like the stigma that's attached to it. You know, it's, it's about, you know, shaking it. And it's also like, look, man, it's like anything, right? Like, you know, you, if you drink or smoke weed all day, every day, it, it's going to fuck you up. But like, if you're responsible with these things and you're using them, be it recreationally or under a doctor's care, um, it can be benefit. It's been pro- these things have proven to be beneficial. So yeah, I'm I'm very curious to dive in to those things. So I'm, I am glad you brought it up, but I I don't want to. Um, I I will forget to ask some questions that I want to ask you. So like I don't want to get too off track, but I definitely want to come back to that if if you're. I'll, I'll throw it. Time. I'll throw a teaser out there. MDMA completely changed my life. So I I, I actually went through. Uh, a course of treatment uh, with someone who does this, you know, under the radar uh, here in here in the United States. How long and uh, it the treatment started. I'd say the treatment is ongoing because what happens is the these drugs are capable of really shaking the snow globe, and and you hit the nail on the head with the care part. If you're not under someone's care, I do not think that these drugs should be used at all. I know how fashionable it is now to like go and do ayahuasca, you know, and yeah. in some other country. I think it's, if, if someone gets somewhere better, great, they're lucky. But w- when you shake the snow globe that vigorously, uh, you really need somebody who is there for what comes after. Because the, the time that you're under the influence of the substance Yes, you may have insights, things shift, but I'd say that the majority of the psychedelic journey is what happens afterwards. And, you know, I, I guess that's to be continued uh, another time, but I did want to throw out there that, that um, I can't cheerlead enough for anybody who thinks that this is a good solution for themselves to please, please, there are people out there, uh, find those people and, well, and how work. Do you find them? Because, I mean, I swear, like, I would absolutely... Um, guinea pig myself or be the guinea pig because I'm always trying to listen I don't think it's I think it's ludicrous to think that you can always be something whether you're always going to be happy or always going to be sad or always whatever but like I definitely am introspective enough to want to understand myself more and understand where I'm coming from and how I'm making decisions and how I can make better decisions and how I can be a better father and a better husband and a better human being and I think part of that there are things that yeah happened in my life that I'm sure are blocking it. And uh, you know, I is whether it's psychotherapy or cognitive behavioral be behavioral therapy or just speaking to a, a therapist, whatever it is, it's like I'm down to try to be a better human. So to hear these types of things definitely makes me more inclined to want to test it out under the care of somebody and not just have to like, you know, go willing can just you know, trial and error. Yeah. It's not what yeah. about at this point. This is no, this, this is your psyche. It's what holds you together. It's the last thing that you want to go trial and error with. Right. Which is, which is why I, you know, I cannot advocate strongly enough against, uh, you know, choosing to do this on one's own or doing it, you know, um, you know, without the, the aftercare system or in another country or, and I know people have had positive experiences too. So I, I respect those positive experiences, but, um, after, uh, spending a considerable amount of time 
um, you know, under the course of care myself, but also um, becoming very uh, well versed, you know, in this area because I do find it fascinating. Um, I really think that the way to go about it is is to find somebody. And and what I would say is that if you look you will find, uh, you know, I can promise because we're also really turning that corner right now uh, as a lot of this, uh, you know, like uh, MDMA is now in phase three. So, um, you know, uh, these these medications will be legal soon. Um, yeah. Uh, but we'll, 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 we'll chat more about that another time yeah, because no, I don't want to sure. derail your questions. No, yeah. no, no, no. Like, I mean, I don't have any, I'm going to be honest. I don't have any like set questions. I just did some research and I, I have some notes, but like, um, you know, this isn't something that I wrote down or anything, but like you're, you live in Florida, right? And you're- I do now, I do now. Yeah, in, I'm, yeah, a, I'm a New York transplant. <laughs> so you're in Massachusetts. Is your family yeah. with you there? No. That's gotta be, I mean, to me, like, I don't know how well I would handle that. It sucks. It absolutely sucks. My, so I, I meditate every single day, but my yeah, spirit- Transcendental meditation or just like any- no, that, that can easily lead into a, another like hour long conversation. I've, I've been studying the mind in some way, shape or form for like, I'd say like 20 years. Um, I, you know, I have all kinds of opinions on, on, on meditation from experience and, and um, you know, by studying um, and there's nothing wrong with transcendental meditation, but uh, I, w- I was one of those people that, um, you know, went off the deep end with, with transcendental meditation and, uh, and I ended up. Uh, you know, rerouting and, and, you know, now I do a more of a breathing fo- focused uh, practice. But um, w- what I'd say is that um, the, the most spiritual time of my day, though, is putting my son to bed. He's, he's nine months old and I put him to bed every single night. And every night when I put him to bed, part of that process is I, you know, I rock him uh, you know, to, to get sleepy. And, um, and I can't tell you what the actual percentage is, but I would say that probably 80% of the time that I do that, I just start crying and I'm not sad about anything. I'm just overwhelmed emotionally. Right. And, um, you know, and I think that, you know, part of what's happened over the last couple of years is that my heart's actually been able to grow. Um, and, and a lot of that has to do with, uh, you know, becoming a father, uh, part of part, the part that precedes it is a lot of this, you know, well, I saw one grow on your journey. Hand. Or is that a tattoo? Yeah, that <laughs> what a I, shitty I, joke. Yeah, so. <laughs> I do, I do, I do, I do have a heart on my, no, I, I have a heart on my hand and it's, um, you know, I, I lead with love and, uh, that's, you know, that's always there to remind me of that. Well, you adopt me. You think? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I no. turned into s- such a sappy guy, you know, like I, I used to be so different I and see, I'm listening to myself. That way. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not bullshitting. You. I don't see it that way. I, I see it as, you know, somebody that's in tune with themselves and their emotions and who they are and what's important. And, you know, there's times where I do feel I have that grasp and I'm just going to talk. I'm just talking whether anybody else in this that's listening gets this. That's fine. If they don't, that's fine too. But like, what, what the way you speak is the way I try to, I want to get to there. Uh, I'm not there all the time. And I feel like the, the times that I do diverge from that path, um, I'm really hard on myself. So to get there is, yeah, like, I, listen, call it sappy, call it whatever you want. But like, you know, I, I've got two kids, they're young and it's the most amazing time ever. Like I rearranged my life. And it's, if there's one, like this awful, horrendous, no good, very bad pandemic, the one thing that's come out of it, you know, there's probably a few positives that I've, uh, but the biggest thing is spending time with my wife and my kids. Um, that's it. And I'm, I'd never want to give that up. I don't want to go back into an office full time again. I don't want to do shit. That's going to take me away from them again. And the way I was living before, I'm really upset with myself for being so removed and just not, you know, I'd, I'd rush home just to pick her up from day, my daughter up from daycare. And then I'd rush her home and try to feed her. And then by the time my wife and I would need to be like nine 30 or 10, like what kind of life is that? Like that's, that's not worth it to me. So when you say it's sappy, I, I think it's something that is, 
pretty, you know, it's, it's, it's inspiring to somebody like me. Well, I, I, I definitely appreciate the, uh, the feedback. It's just, you know, it's like, I'm listening to myself and it, it's just, I can't tell you what a trip it is that, you know, like I, I always, look, I like when I was in my, uh, twenties, I, uh, competed in, you know, kickboxing, Muay Thai. Um, I, then I got into powerlifting. Um, you know, I, I, I did these things that were like, you know, I don't know, top, you know, kind of things. And they, they coincided with, uh, you know, a, um, this persona that, you know, that was just total crap. Um, you know, I, I, part of, uh, you know, the, the PTSD, uh, you know, um, I mean, even without PTSD, I mean, like, like people, it, this isn't just men, it's people want to feel safe. That that's like, at the end of the day, that that's, that's a major motivating, uh, force for the organism. Right. And sometimes in the attempt to become safe, we build our walls so high that we don't, you know, we, we, we're completely isolated. We, we no longer get to genuinely experience, feel, be vulnerable. Uh, and, and that's where like a lot of the, actually not a lot of, probably all of the sweetness in life uh, is to be experienced in, in this, um, this state of, of being open, vulnerable, which is like scary, you know, especially to, 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 to guys like we, you know, we, we, we tend to posture and, and present ourselves a certain way. And, and um, like, you know, it's cool to be like apathetic and, you know, uh, you know, even like, look at like the, the dynamics of like dating and stuff like that. Like, you know, the, like the guy's role, like, you know, is, is sort of like it's almost expected to be like non-caring and like, uh, you know, uh, um, emotionally unavailable uh, to a certain extent, you know, like you don't really often see like you know, or hear stories of, you know, guys, uh, you know, oh, even if they've fallen head over heels, admitting it, you know, and just like, you know, and whereas women, you know, will do that. They'll write the letter like to the guy that they just started dating, you know, because like sometimes it doesn't even happen like in a face to face and they put all their thoughts into a letter. And then if you're the guy getting that letter, it's almost like too much. Yeah. You know, it's almost like weird to hear it because we're so out of tune with saying, well, this is how I feel and I'm going to present it. We don't do that. Yeah. No, you're, you know, which, you're right about that. Um, it's almost like you get that letter uh, or, or something that's the equivalent and you're like, oh my God, how clingy is this person? You know, like it's, it's almost, it's, you're, it's, like it's, it's conditioned to be a turnoff in a way. Yep. Not, like it should be like, wow, cool. Like it, there's no games to be played. There's none of that bullshit that's going on. So uh, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, as um, I don't know, I guess it's like, as let me, a, let me ask like, you this. Yeah. Let me ask you this question. Wow, you're asking. Okay, okay. Oh shit! I hope I studied. Here we go. No, it's not going to be that kind of question. Oh, did, did 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 you watch uh, like Lethal Weapon, Rambo, Die Hard? That those movies growing up. Yeah, of course. Okay, so, so did I. All right, let let's take a look at just those movies for a second. All right. So I don't know if these names will be familiar to you, but Martin Riggs. That was Mel Gibson and Lethal Weapon. Come, come on, don't insult my intelligence here. Like these are questions not, not, I do know. I, not, I don't not, know. <laughs> all right. Uh, so we got John Rambo, obviously from Rambo, and then do you remember Bruce Bruce Willis's character in Die Hard? Uh, John McClane. Yup. There we go. Bravo. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Now here's the thing. They're all so cool. They're all so cool. They're these ultra macho, dangerous, and and you know fearless, crazy guys who are emotionally wounded lone wolves with quick wit and, you know, and sense of humor who act above the law and who all in their, you know, as part of their story have poor, you know, have ruined relationships with women, right. you know, like, and then we, so, so like I grew up watching these movies in the eighties and all of like my heroes were these fucked up dudes. Yeah. 
No, I, I know. And then mean. as now as an adult, I'm kind of like, and I don't look, I don't want to sound like a, a killjoy, you know, like uh, I don't want to, I don't want to take the joy of these movies out of, uh, you know, out of anybody who who watches them. My point is not where, like, those are all badass movies. Okay. Right. Like I still think they're badass movies, but the thing is, you know, the influence of seeing this kind of cool guy who's like kind of screwed up and like can't manage his relationships with women and does things that are kind of crazy. And like, it's very easy as a, as a young child to model yourself. Like, you're like, that's the hero. I want to be that guy. And the thing is, as a kid, you can't pick and choose. Like a kid doesn't go, yeah, but you know what? Divorce sucks. You know, like, First of all, it hurts everybody involved. Secondly, only the attorneys make money. You know, and, like that, that's not what what a, what a kid's you know thinking right. about. You just like you hear the whole. And I'm not saying that kids necessarily think, oh, I'd, because they watch it, I'd like to get divorced when I grow up. But you get like this package deal, right? You get it an archetype, and you don't get the pieces. You just absorb the archetype. And you want to be cool and you want to be a guy's guy and you want to be all of those things. And, um, you know, this this uh, mimetic uh, coding becomes part of who we are, just like our genetic coding is part of who we are. So we absorb all this and we become the thing and it can really screw us up. Um, I, I just want to go on record to say I don't want to be anything like Mel Gibson. Uh, so, so, um, and the other guys, uh, either their characters or, or who they are, but like, um, I do get what you're saying. Like th those are people that you end up like, you know, you watch these characters and you start to think, wow, they're so cool. But really like when you kind of strip away some of the, the layers, it's like, but he's kind of a dick to his wife. Is that really how I want to be? And, uh, the answer to me is no, because my wife is awesome. And, um, I'm pretty sure she could probably beat me up. So there's all that too. Um, but I definitely want to talk to you quickly about um, how I how I got connected with you in the first place. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about, you know, Altus Movement Technology. I know we featured you in um, the fall edition of Muscle and Fitness as well as Muscle and Fitness Hers. Um, ask me how to uh, get those right now. And I don't know. Uh, no one's told me. So that's cool. Um, but I will have that info at some point very shortly as they're producing it um but it's okay so you go from the correspondent on the today, on the today show and you've done you did some other things uh and, and please feel free to fill in the gaps because i was trying to look this up and try to piece it all together the timeline um how do you get to this point and then we can kind of get into what it is that the, the new company does I'm curious. Yeah, it's it's funny because as you were saying that, I was like, yeah, I speak the same way I work, you know, or, or or that my my career is the same way <laughs> that I speak, which is very nonlinear. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just like all over the place. Um, so so yeah, um, what I'd say is that what set me on the current journey, which you know, we're creating we're bringing to market, I should say, because we created already, we're bringing to market the world's first AI personal trainer uh, in, um, in, in uh, late Q1, early Q2 of next year. And uh, it's a device that is about the size of a sound bar. Uh, it's virtually invisible in your home. It plugs into any screen, just like an Apple TV would. So, you know, connects to the internet, connects through HDMI to your, to your uh, screen. And inside the device, we have uh, cameras and a, um, you know, they're running a proprietary uh, computer vision uh, neural network, which, which is a form of artificial intelligence. And it's in computer vision is the way that software is able to see, you know, uh, uh, an object or subject uh, in space. And uh, the, the, the technology we've created is really so robust that we, in essence, uh, have created GPS for human movement. Uh, there is nothing out there that is even remotely close to tracking the body in, in 3D, uh, including it's truly 4D because uh, velocity and time are part of that, that equation. Uh, but 3D with all of the joint rotations, it just absolutely nothing compares to it. And 
We also built a uh, very robust as well machine learning model for exercise science. So uh, we, we had, um, uh, or have, I should say, a team of people who are literally Olympic directors, strength and conditioning coaches at the, you know, at the pro leagues, uh, people who literally call LeBron a client, who uh, uh, the, the, this uh, machine learning model was built on, you know, built on the intelligence. Of. So uh, that is, that is uh, uh, coming to market um, in, in Q1, Q2 of this, uh, this coming year. Uh, all and this movement technology, correct? Yeah, that's, just all this. Altus? Yeah, it, yeah. That's the full name of the company is Altus Movement Technologies. But Altus, you know, we, we're you know for the purposes of brevity. Uh, Altus. What is Altus <laughs> like? What is that? What is uh? How did you come up with that name? Yeah, um, it was like a generic placeholder name that eventually became the name of the company. So, um, it just like for for all you know, the funny thing is it it shows you like the 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 risk of doing that. Like we were just like we need to just give this like a cool name for because we started this several years ago as a project to see how far we could push, you know, just the computer vision element to this whole thing. And, you know, in its project phase, we had to call it something. So it just started, uh, um, you, you know, it was called Altus and then the name just stuck. Uh, so that's what it is. Um, but, um, you know, the, the whole thing started like 10 years ago. I, um, I got this for uh, 10 years. Well, well, not, not, the technology itself is only a few years. Uh, so it started, the, conceptually this started in late 2018, work began in early 2019. Um, and, uh, but, but before that, way before that, when this was not even in my, on my radar, I was, uh, I got tapped by Michelle Obama to create a technology-based program for Let's Move, her childhood obesity initiative. And I created a program that leveraged early wearables and it ended up being the most successful uh, uh, program underneath that entire uh, campaign. And you're in New Jersey, right? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. So we, we did. We ran our uh, the the um, the pilot program in Newark uh, with um, you know a good friend of mine and mentor Corey Booker, yeah. and um, he was the vice chair of uh, of Let's Move, and um, really really a successful you guys have the campaign. Same hairstyle. I know. But he, I think he rocks it better than I do. Um, and, and also like, I don't know if his is by, by choice. Mine is no longer by choice. Like it, it was, and then all of a sudden it wasn't. And, uh, you know, I had like that, that, that single tear just uh, coming down my cheek as I realized that I'm not doing this because I really want to anymore. Uh, but, uh, but yes, yeah, so anyway, so I had the, you know, I had the opportunity to uh, expand that program nationally uh, I ended up not pursuing that track for a variety of reasons that I'd rather not get into. Now, um, what I will say for the purpose of brevity is that I'm not a politician. It's not what I do. So um, it wasn't the right gig for me. And um, trust me, I will ask you about this later on uh, because <laughs> I, 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 but I, I respect what you're saying right now, but uh, I'm definitely going to try to dig because I'm curious. I'm curious about you and your journey. And I, I just, I feel like, in my in my heart i know what you're trying to say like without trying to say it but uh you know i i'm just i'm just gonna let you know i will i will press later on for that yeah you you may or may not get it out of me but i, I probably but yeah will. i'm just i'm not i don't think so either i'm just not into politics you know like yeah. i i think that there's a lot to be said about the private sector and um you know and that's where i where where i focus my efforts and and so, um, you know, I walked away from that, though, thinking, wow, that really worked, you know, and this was like, it was kind of new at the time, because most people didn't think about technology really meaningfully intersecting with uh, health and fitness, you know, like, the world was actually a very different place when it came to, uh, you know, to technology then. And, you know, other than like heart rate monitors and stuff, like what, what other technology were, you know, were people really using? And so, so I thought it was super cool. And I was like, wow, this actually works. So I just, I pocketed that, like, you know, that lesson or that learning. And I knew I was going to do something with it. I just didn't know what. Right. And then, um, you know, the connected fitness category starts opening up and I watched it grow. And I, I thought to myself, um, I don't know if I lost you there. 
No, oh, you did, but like, okay. don't worry about it. It's fine. <laughs> so uh, there you are. But uh, hey, keep going. Don't, don't, yeah, so, don't so stop you. So, 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 you know, I watched the category grow and I really wanted to take my time to line up my shot because I knew I was going to do something in the category because I found it uh, fascinating. And this is obviously pre-COVID. I just thought that this was something important was happening. And, um, and then I finally, you know, kind of landed at a place where I was like, I know exactly what I'm going to do because one of the things that I, I kind of felt was missing was you know, the, the name of the category was interesting, connected fitness. The, you know, it meant one thing. It meant that it was connected to the internet, but it wasn't, in my opinion, connected to the user. It didn't understand who they were. It didn't personalize things for them. Um, you know, it didn't do what like a real coach does, or I should say a real quality coach does. And, you know, or trainer. And uh, so I, I knew that I wanted to do something that would bring the experience of having an elite coach into someone's home. Okay. And I wanted to something that would be a fraction of the cost of any of the other offerings that were, that were out there. So just like in terms of aligning with like, you know, I guess where business mission aligns with spiritual mission, you know, which is nice when they align. And I think it's important to find one that the concept of democratizing access to quality uh, health and fitness resources. So, you know, the, the category itself was priced very high, you know, minimal entry points of around $2,000. And, um, and so I, I knew that I wanted to create something that was simply, you know, very easy to use plug and play, like, you know, just like if you get, you know, any other component for your home, you just stick it in the, you know, in the screen, didn't take up a lot of space, you know, so you didn't need to allocate new space for it, it would meet you exactly where you are, how you need it. So, completely exercise and equipment agnostic. So if someone's a poor mover, so to speak, it can work with them. If someone's a great mover, it can work with them. If someone has zero equipment, they can use all this. If someone has tons of equipment, you know, they can use all this. I really, you know, I wanted to create this magical thing. Uh, and I was really clear on, on what it was that I wanted to, uh, to create. And as luck would have it, uh, I met uh, my first co-founder who's an expert in, um, machine learning and computer vision, uh, serial technologist, entrepreneur, and uh, you know, multi-exit guy. And then I, I ended up picking up another co-founder who had 1.1 billion reasons that I should have him as a co-founder, uh, his exit value in the five years prior uh, from two different ventures. And, um, and, and you know, I, I think that when you're clear on your uh, vision, that, um, you know, I, I don't think that, I don't believe in like the law of attraction, you know, like I, I think, I believe in the law of doing, you know, but if you have that clarity and you're kind of like, no, this is it, this is what I want to do. And you just keep on pushing towards it. That does tend to somehow uh, attract um, your collaborators. And, um, you know, in, in my case, I was very fortunate that it worked out that way. And I'm very humbled to work with the people that I'm working with. Do you at all get concerned uh, with the fact that, uh, you know, um, so, you know, early on in the pandemic, I read studies that like um, health and fitness app downloads were up like 50% uh, prior uh, the prior year. You know, as it kind of goes on, people are, are you know, traffic to gyms are going, is going back. Do you think like, shoot, I missed my window or like, like does, does it kind of like kind of eat at you and, and not to you know because businesses you know it's it's you strike while the iron's hot right like so you got you want to get in while people are going to be either captive or you're going to get their attention like do you think like do you think about that stuff do you get like does it keep you up do you get nervous or are you just like you know what if this doesn't work uh I'm going to school now and uh, I'm going to be good. Or, or, or what do you think? Cause uh, you know, you do have investors and you do have people that are going to at some point be like, yo, what's up with that loot? Uh, does it keep you up? Does it, does it kind of uh, give you a little anxiety or are you just come what may? And if it, if it works great, if not, Hey man, suck it. Yeah. I mean, I, I just kind of feel, you know, zero pressure. Um, basically put my head on the pillow every night and go to sleep immediately. And, um, you know, I really just never worry. And of course I'm lying through my teeth. Um, I, I constantly worry 
Uh, I like to win. I like to succeed. I believe with every fiber of my body and the product that we're building, the value it's going to deliver, how many lives it's going to impact and change. Um, you know, and of course, how much money, you know, the company will make and, and you know, the return that it will uh, present for investors. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, I'm incredibly stressed out about it all the time. I have immense confidence in what we're doing. And I certainly don't have any fear of having um, missed out on anything. I'm not building uh, a new tchotchke uh, for people to use during the next pandemic. I, I am building a very serious technology platform that I think is going to revolutionize the exercise and movement-based instruction industries. And that's why we've had so much success early on uh, picking up early B2B clients that includes large physical therapy chains, gym chains, and uh, hospitality titans like Hyatt. Got it. Um, look, I, I could talk to you some more. In fact, I could talk to you for a long time, but I know we- um, We'll do it again. We gotta get going. I, I hope so. Please promise me you'll, you'll, you'll do it again because I have so many more questions and I, I, there's so much more that I wanna cover. And uh, I just, I don't know, I appreciate your time and I'm, I'm gracious, that I, I'm grateful that you, you know, you gave this much time and uh, just to, to let us know and let me know specifically about what, what you're up to. But I, I find your story really interesting and thank you for sharing and apologies if uh, I'm a little pushy, but I just, I don't know, man, like I, I want to know about you and I, I'm always curious about people who are successful and how they got there. And especially the ones that didn't take that linear path um, or weren't given something, uh, you know, like uh, or it didn't get a silver spoon to, to start with. So it's let's be let's let's just be careful with how we define success. Well, right. It's, that's it's that, that's why I, I honestly I shy away. I appreciate the, the comment, but what I'd say is that in business, that's what I meant. Right. And and even in business, like how do you measure that? But that's all personal, right? Like somebody like Jeff Bezos may find define success different than me. Um and I'm not trying to catch that guy, but like the, 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 the idea being that like um, you're doing from what you told me, uh, you're doing what you want to do and you're getting there and you're getting opportunities and you're doing it by staying, you know, true to who you are and, and, and your morals and your values. And that to me is awesome because in media, I've just like, I'm sure you have, I've seen a lot of people sell their souls to try to get ahead. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. And I don't want to be one of those people. Uh, I'd rather fucking slam my head in the door than do that. So um, what, what I would offer is that, that I'm doing the best I can, that I struggle just like everybody else does, uh, that I am afraid like everybody else is, that I hurt just like everybody else does, and that in a typical day, I experience all of these emotions, no matter what's going on, because I'm a human being and I'm alive and I'm in the ride. You know, I'm 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 like on the ride, of, you know, no, of life right. itself. You know? I know, but you're also and, a guy that's going to Harvard, and you're also a guy that that's backing <laughs> a very, very um, a company that has a very high, in, in my opinion, from seeing demos of it and and understanding it being in this business a long time. Uh, I think it's cool, uh, and the truth is, like, uh, I don't have. I didn't have to talk to you. I didn't have to say, oh yeah, I'll, 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 you know, I'll chat with this guy. I just saw what you were doing and I thought it was interesting. And I really was like, wow, that's really cool. Like I didn't even know your story or your background. I didn't care. I just was like, damn, that's a cool idea. And then when I learned about you, I was even more interested. So that, that's all I'm saying. I just, it, it's cool. And I'm, and I'm grateful. Um, can you do me a favor and just let me know how people can either uh, keep tabs on you. Um, I know what you're yeah. doing. Uh, do you have, so, what's so your address? I got, I got number? a lot. Of, yeah, exactly. You, I'll give you, I, you know, my social security number actually yeah. would probably be more useful than my like pen. <laughs> Twitter or Instagram <laughs> handles because I I've abandoned, uh, social media for the most part. I just, you know, this is, it might be a whole other conversation, but I just find it so, uh, toxic. Uh, that I don't want to participate. And there, there, look, there are people out there that we both know who are doing great jobs and actually have very inspirational accounts and you know all of that. But I'm not talking about any of that. I just, the overall thing, I just, I, I don't like it. And so I have nothing to promote. I have nothing to sell anybody. 
<laughs> Except I, all this technology. Like, where, well, where can they find that? Where can they get when, info on it? When it yeah, when it co- when it comes out, um, we'll probably have a pre-order site up. You know, like at some point over the next couple of months. I'm like the worst promoter. Um, we'll have a pre-order <laughs> site. I can't direct anybody anywhere right now. We'll have a pre-order site up pretty soon, and then we're going to start getting our first units out. You know, in Q1, um, it's it will be revolutionary. The one thing I can promise everybody is that they will never have experienced anything like it. All right. Look, man, um, I look forward to continuing this and I just want to thank you again. Really. Thanks a lot for everything, Jeff. I'm in brother. Next time. Later. All right. Take care. Bye. Today's show is generously sponsored by GNC. From the number one selling lit pre-workout to the game-changing Burn MF, Beyond Raw formulas are made to make a real difference. And with the explosive flavors like Jolly Rancher Watermelon and Green Apple, Gummy Worm and Iced Tea Lemonade, you'll keep coming back for more. So get to GNC or GNC.com and go beyond the fire with Beyond Raw.